Hello, everyone. My name is Charlie Rodnewson, and I'm a practice coach with the Academy of Professional Excellence, the San Diego State Research Foundation. I'm so excited to bring to you the Academy i3 podcast. This is a series of podcasts where we lead with open hearts and open minds to inspire, inquire, and impact the workforce. Okay, so we've had a great conversation so far in our first part. Now in our second part, we really want to start to dive in a little bit more into you know, strategies as well as the organizational health organizational health framework and the I3 experience. And later at the end, we'll start to talk about how, how did we overcome those challenges? So let me start by pitching it over to Jen to be able to talk a little bit more about what the I3 experience is. Yes, thank you. So at the Academy, we've developed an org health framework that we call the I3 experience. At the Academy, we talk, our principles are led by inquire, inspire, impact. And so what we've done is we've identified ways that we are really leaning into inquiry, inspiration, and impact across an employee's journey with the academy. So beginning with recruitment and onboarding, carrying through development, retention, and then all the way through to separation. So our goal is that throughout the journey with the academy, they're experiencing things in a way that truly are reflective of our principles to inquire with humility, to inspire with heart, and to impact mindfully. And I'll I'll allow Manola to share some specific strategies we've done around that, and then I will add on to that. Thank you, Jen, for um, leading us into this next portion of of what we're talking about. Um, I think one of the strategies that I really feel is most important is to listen to others. When we have the humility to be able to listen closely and carefully to others, we learn so much. And in that learning, we begin to find and see the changes that are needed to be able to move forward effectively. One of the things that I think it's important to remember is that who do you need to pay attention the most to? What we usually, what we often do, I don't know if it's usually, but we often do is pay attention to the people that we're comfortable with. We listen to them because we already know what they're going to say. We know how they're going to say it and it's easy to listen to. I think it's really important to listen to the people who are least understood. Those are the people that are going to challenge you, challenge your thinking, and to give you some space to make some changes yourself. Um, I think that we um, need to have the patience to be able to sit with that information that doesn't quite fit into our thinking and the patience to be able to make some changes within yourself. I think it's important to inquire also um, after listening instead of making assumptions. It's great and easy to make assumptions because it's comfortable. Again, um, if, if we can in this moment of listening, inquire for more depth, then we have a greater understanding. Um, these are things that aren't um, amazing and new. They're just a little difficult and out of our comfort zone. If we can do this, then we will be able to more easily fight the resistance um, to regress, to go to our old behaviors. When we listen to someone and they're telling us something that is different than when we, what we expect and what we assume, we want to go back to old behaviors. And if we are truly, truly inquiring with humility, then we won't. And we have a foundation to be able to fight our, our tendency or a desire to regress. I think 
Um, this, I, I think you can see where we've done these things and some of the things that Jen said in the beginning about how we hire people by listening to what people are saying about the hiring process, not the ones who thought it was great and they're really excited about this wonderful process, but ones who say, you know, that first part that you did X, I really stumbled over that and that made me question whether I wanted to work with you or it made me answer in a way that wasn't as full as I could have. Um, that gives us more information to change and shift our interview process, our um, recruitment process, so that we become more inclusive. Chime in on the listening yes, front. Thank you for bringing that up. I was actually going to highlight that as one of my key strategies as well on this journey of learning and growth and development around culturally responsive leadership. One of the key things I've focused on is listening to be able to truly hear what's being said and not just looking at data and qualitative number, I'm sorry, quantitative numbers, but really being able to talk with staff at an individual level or in groups or teams or the broader organization to have a better understanding of what people are saying. And that only can happen when you're truly providing folks the space to tell their stories about their experience. And that can happen informally, that can happen in formal spaces we create to get this type of feedback. That happens when I do exit interviews for staff that I do it on a voluntary basis to help inform our employee experience where I can really hear the, the authentic stories folks are sharing because it's really those stories that help inform the changes that are needed. And one of the things that I've really found in terms of being able to lean into inquiry and to listen is the need to be present with my body. So I've really increased the embodiment practices personally, because I think there's listening with your head and there's listening physiologically to the emotional reactions that are happening because you're in a situation, you're hearing feedback, it might be activating some emotion with you. And if you don't have the awareness of the fact that, that emotion is being activated, the response you're going to have and the reaction is going to be detrimental. It's going to lead to regression. You're going to revert back to prior behaviors, even if your intention is to do better. And the, the other thing that the embodiment has done for me is, you know, in the times of COVID and extreme stress and challenges that we're facing, we have to acknowledge that we're showing up as humans and we're showing up with a great deal of overwhelmment and stress. And when our bodies are dealing with that sensation of being overwhelmed and stressed, it takes a lot more effort and energy to be fully present, to listen and to engage with staff. So if you don't have some type of grounding practice or take the intentional pauses as need be, and instead you're in back-to-back -back meetings, I'm sorry, but you're not in the emotional headspace to truly be able to take things in at the mm -hmm. level that needs that you need to be hearing things to truly bring about change. So the, the being in touch with the embodiment practice has been monumentally important in my from my perspective. Absolutely. And, and especially when, when, when I go back to reflect on inclusivity, you know, it, I think it, it sort of takes on sort of a new layer and a new meaning now where it, it, it goes beyond just sort of who's represented within the organization, but it also becomes how do we support, truly support those who are within our organization in many ways, you know, to, to even speak from my example, I know for me, like, if I'm approached with maybe a situation that feels uncomfortable or maybe activating for me, and I, I'm not the type of person that can sort of be able to process that in the moment very easily. My emotions are pretty apparent and, and they, they are felt very um, intensely. And that's just how I am as a em more empathic type of person. And so to be able to have the inclusivity of, I don't necessarily have to be forced to confront that in this moment but I know those who are there, my colleagues, my um, supervisor, leadership, I, I can have the, the, the comfort in knowing that I can follow up with them, that I feel safe to follow up with them, and that they're going to follow up with me to check in as well. And, I, and that is sort of what I feel to be very inclusive for me, that I, I have that understanding. I don't have to fit into this mold of what is to be expected of me, but I can bring myself into this and still be embraced by those around me. 
you're bringing up the fact that inclusivity is is well beyond cultural differences in terms of just ethnicity, but we're talking about different ways you process information, different needs you have. Intro, are you introverted and extroverted? How how are you able to show up in your best manner? And how can the organization be responsive to your needs in that way so that you can do so when the time is right for you and then when you can be the most productive or the most um, effective in your communication? So that's another lens of diversity that we're looking at is style differences that folks bring inherently to the organization. And in and saying that, I don't want us to fall um, victim to the idea that that's the only, that's the one that we need to focus on, um, that, that we, we need to constantly look at all of our identities and that people aren't singly identified um, and that there's more than just whatever you, whatever you want to label, <laughs> there's more than just. And all of those are incorporated and all of those have to be included when we're talking or none of it gets included because um, you can't come in with part of your identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we talk about cultural responsiveness, just the word responsiveness and what we mean by that is so important to keep in mind because the, the tools and practices that we're talking about here are to allow leaders to be responsive to whatever the staff member is bringing or that regardless of the situation, it's just teaching you to, to rather than default to the way you do things, but to tailor your interactions in a way that is responsible to the, to the human being in front of you who presents all aspects of themselves that need a responsive approach. So responsivity is, is so key in these tools and skills that we've been really working to develop, allow us to be more responsive to one another as human beings and all that you bring and present in your daily work. I, yes, 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 yes. And when I hear that, I hear a small voice in the back of my head saying something that I think some of our listeners are going to be saying, yeah, that's a lot of work. And isn't my job to lead? And I can't, how can I be so individual and still lead? I have a lot of people working here. I, how can I do that and still be effective as a leader? Yes. I mean, it's, it takes a great deal of additional intentionality and effort and focused time and space for those conversations that allow for that responsivity to happen because it takes relationship building and rapport building that if it hasn't been prioritized, there's not an ability to do the work at the individual's, the level that would meet the individual's needs. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of building of a foundation that, that has to happen beforehand. And building any foundation is an awful lot of work. And when it's done, when the foundation is built, um, you're then supporting it as opposed to rebuilding it every time. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the things that we're talking about is about building that foundation and or reinforcing a foundation that's already there. You were gonna say something. Go ahead, if, if you're not done, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. The foundation being, of course, building trust. So trust being the essential element of what's needed there. And how do we, what are the ways that we work to really build that foundation where there can be trust to be able, in my mind, to have conversations that can lead to, you know, greater connection. And that sometimes difficult when you're a leader because building trust means showing up authentically, vulnerably, humanly, and we're, we're conditioned, I would say, particularly as a woman in leadership, you're conditioned to be strong and not show emotion because then you might be perceived as weak and incapable. And so when you have the need to really show that you're human and you're vulnerable, it's very difficult to do because it makes you feel like you're not the expert. You're not the be all know all. You don't actually have it all together, um, but it's not 
possible for folks to always have it all together. So how do we really show up with vulnerability? It takes a lot of trust to be of the team to be able to do that. And it takes a lot of trust in ourselves to know that by doing so, ultimately, you're going to have a better experience with your staff and your team because you're Mm -hmm. countering the narrative that we have to be perfect and that we have to all the white supremacy culture characteristics that are expected to be conveyed you're really contributing to those and reinforcing those if you're not allowing yourself to counter the expectations around perfectionism and strong leadership that doesn't include uh, real human experience mm -hmm. and i i would i i really appreciate what you just said and i would add to it that <laughs> Um, when you add a number of other identities, being a person mm -hmm. of color, um, uh, being LGBTIQ+, um, being um, poor, being uh, it just add on those mm -hmm. other identities and a person in leadership, you add on um, additional difficulties that need to be overcome for you to be able to feel safe and comfortable enough mm -hmm. to do this and to demonstrate for your organization that this is the appropriate and okay safe thing to do. Um, it is um, when you as a leader are vulnerable but don't allow others to be vulnerable or haven't provided the space yet for them to be feel safe to be vulnerable, then nothing is being built. Mm -hmm. And I I think sometimes we make the mistake of of starting something without a foundation. Mm -hmm. And I would go back to that conversation that you had about building the trust, about um, um, setting the stage so that we can move forward and do that. And I and I think that we in, in the academy have struggled and moved um, to a point, and I, and I think it really needs to be heard. We have struggled to move to the point where we are now, where there is a foundation, and that foundation is clear to most people. It's not always clear to everybody, but it's clear to most people, and that we have some place to rise up from that... Um, that has to be done before we can move forward. I think we tried moving forward without a foundation and, and we fell on our face and we got up and tried it again. Um, but until that foundation is there, you will have this wobbly step mm -hmm. yes. and process. Yeah, and, and certainly going back to what you had said, Manola, about you know, this, this feels like a lot, this feels like it's, it's sort of adding more to the plate of what already feels like a lot, mm -hmm. to which I would say, you know, imagine sort of the impact of this intentionality, you know, if we start mm -hmm. to really sort of look into how a lot of what we put into culture responsive leadership, inclusive culture, and the framework of organizational health, if we're able to be intentional with that and building the foundation of trust and being able to commit to this, think about the impact that it could have for the workforce, mm -hmm. for the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so then what that could then start to result in, mm -hmm. because otherwise, if, if we didn't sort of see that potential impact, then this work you know, maybe for not, and, and, and it may sort of feel like it is a lot. Mm -hmm. However, if we sort of see like, wow, like how could this be reimagined? How can this be different for us? That could be the impact. And it then may not feel like a lot, perhaps. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I agree. And I'm not sure that I am um, concerned that it's a lot. Um, I think, I think when things are easy, we don't necessarily learn as much. Um, I don't think we necessarily change as much. So I'm not concerned that I just know that 
sometimes in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, this is so much the reality. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, this, it, it's, I, I don't want also for people to walk away with the idea that this is an easy thing. We just did this and, and we're, it's like, cool. This is hard work. And, and you do have to do something that really is contrary to um, our upbringing in America and, our, and about white supremacy culture it, it is, that I, am, I have incorporated. There is a need to have things done quickly. This isn't a, okay, do these five behaviors and you'll have this wonderful culture that will do all these wonderful things and you'll make more money and da 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 da. That's not it. It's hard work. It takes a while. And it's, it's, it's work that needs to be reinforced constantly. And every time you make a mistake, you have to repair. Um, and these are all things that, that I would like to just, you know, I'm, I made the dress, I'm done. I, I you know, um, I don't want to have to you know, add a new button on. I don't want to, because sometimes I just want to be done. And I, and I think that's a normal way mm -hmm. of thinking and feeling, and it needs to be acknowledged. Um, and that you, you may need, um, and I think this is the other part about the challenges. I think you, you need um, a team of people that support you. So when you are saying, <laughs> I don't want to work anymore, that someone else is saying, yeah, and I'll help you carry the load right now. But the reality is we're still moving. We're still moving forward. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep going. And if you don't have that, whether it's your colleagues or um, somebody outside of your organization, mm -hmm. then it's, 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 it, fe it may feel insurmountable. 100% agree with what you said. And I would even dare to say it gets harder before it gets easier. Because once you start, you have this foundational trust established, you've got the skill set and the knowledge base to be able to actually have these leaning into inquiry, having these conversations, you're going to hear things you didn't want to hear, or, you know, you need to know them, but things that you wouldn't have heard before. And so it completely changes the number of things that you need to be addressing because the real work gets uncovered. But until that work is truly uncovered and can be addressed and rectified and repairs made where needed, you're gonna be stuck. Um, and you have to, just what Manola said, you have to have an outlet. You have to have a peer group as a CEO. I don't have a peer group within the organization I can turn to. So I have to look at external, a coach, a mentor, a support group, because these are the types of things that can be extremely weighing down as you're trying to kind of grapple with what you're hearing and reconciling that with what you thought was reality, you know, what you're re and rec acknowledging the fact that your reality is, is, is very different than the reality of others who are perceiving the organization differently. So the support system, the ability to really process that through and ideally have a coach to bounce things off of is incredibly important. Otherwise, it's easy to just tap out and say, no, it was easier just to stay here at the surface level instead of delving deep into the work. Mm -hmm. I think you, you said something else, um, Jen, that made me um, remember about recovery principles. Um, that idea that your reality is different from the others, other people's. And I think that's a hard one to hold on to, that your reality is your reality. Nobody is denying that. And my reality is different from yours. And that that's okay. And real and valid. I, we often want to have one single reality. Mine, preferably. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but there is a desire to have for everybody to understand your reality and not be able to um, hold that there are two realities at the same time, yours and mine, and a third if there's a third person. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
I, I think that's a, a little snippet that we need to keep referring back to, but not one that is that generally comes to mind. But when you said that, it's like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that. Yeah. And I will say, I will admit, so Manola and I have had years ago, you know, we began these discussions and Manola is sharing experiences with me, finally, like feeling comfortable to start to share some experiences with me that are really contrary to my perception of how the academy rolls. I'm like, no, wait, it's like the best place to work ever. Our culture is this, look at our satisfaction survey, look at our engagement results. And Manola started saying, Jen, you're one person, you're maybe hearing certain perspectives, maybe others are not feeling comfortable elevating those yet. This is my experience. I've had some different experiences than that. And where are the opportunities for us to be open to hearing more about those experiences so we can acknowledge what we've got and build and grow, build on it and enhance it based on these different perspectives that are coming in to inform the work. And so we've worked a lot on that, Manola, mm -hmm. in the last few yes. years. Yeah. Yes. And it and it requires both people to be able to recognize that the realities are not the same. And it goes back to being able to listen with humility. And listen to hear versus just to respond. Yes. And listen with our bodies and what our bodies are telling us instead of shutting down and going into conflict avoidance mode, like lean in. Mm -hmm all things that are contrary to what we have been taught as leaders. <laughs> exactly. If we can't acknowledge the human experience that someone is showing up with and sharing with us, it's all for naught. Like we have to be able to hear and acknowledge and be in community with folks in a way that allows that human experience to come forward. Otherwise we're not getting to the depth of anything. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I love how you, you, you all mentioned sort of like the white supremacy culture characteristics, you know, within organizations where, you know, everything that you've sort of talked up to this point, there's really what I'm starting to notice is slowing down process. There's really just being able to slow down, like you said, to be able to listen both from the heart, the mind, the body, and, and, and allowing that to create more space. I, would, I, I don't know, like in my mind, I just sort of see an expanded space to really sort of allow others to kind of fill that in however they choose to. And I wanted to really follow up on, on, on this question. It's not part of our, you know, outline, but I think it's, it'll be something interesting nonetheless. But I'm, I'm kind of curious when, when you all brought up sort of vulnerability, that with vulnerability, of course, I think everybody experiences and interprets that differently. How would you all sort of gauge what is, I guess, to be considered a, maybe a sort of a safe vulnerability, you know, a vulnerability where others can still feel safe to bring in their themselves, their identities and all that in, in a way that it, it sort of brings people together. Because I know for some vulnerability kind of could be hard. And so how, how, do, how, do, how do you all as leaders sort of, I guess, promote that vulnerability that can really help to enrich the, the space within the organization? I think, I think you need to get permission and acknowledge and define safety. Because right now, what generally speaking, we say safety, we mean that you're not going to be uncomfortable, you're not going to be um, challenged, you're not, um, yeah, I think that's enough. Um, and what we're, what we're talking about and being vulnerable is being open to being uncomfortable and staying and sitting with that, with that feeling of uncomfortableness um, and not opening ourselves up to be um, injured, um, and and then defining the difference between harm and what is it? Harm and hurt. Mm -hmm. um, you say something that 
bothers me, I don't like, I'm uncomfortable with, that may hurt me. But I'm harmed when there is long-term damage done. And what we often say is harm is you said something that I don't like. Well, I'm going to say something you don't like all the time. It's impossible for me not to, because we're not the same person. So there are going to be times when I'm going, it's, it's going to happen over and over and over again, just because we're humans. The difference is I'm not going to do things and, and I'm, it's not okay for me to do things that are harming you. And I have to take ownership. If I can't be vulnerable enough to be hurt, then when you tell me that I've done something that harms you, that has caused long-term damage, my response is going to be, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And because I can't tolerate that. So no, I didn't. And I just invalidated you and harmed you even more. Mm -hmm. So vulnerability for me, and, I, and I'd love for you to expand on this, Jen, is about allowing myself and allowing others to be in uncomfortable situations without causing long-term harm. Mm -hmm. I think it's something we're having to have daily conversations with our staff as individuals and with our broader community because of that tendency to protect one's self in a situation and avoid the conversation because it feels uncomfortable. And what we're having to, I think, model and then share expectations around is no, our expectation when you, even in our interview process, when you join the academy, we're going to, you're going to be uncomfortable. Like, how, how are you with that? Because we're going to expect you to get uncomfortable and have the conversations that are needed to really advance our work. And so I think part of our effort as leadership team is to normalize the discomfort, normalize the fact that that's going to happen, that's going to be expected. It's part of how our culture operates so that it's clear up front, even in our onboarding process, we can be really explicit about what that looks like. Yeah, otherwise we are normalizing harm. And avoidance. Mm -hmm. And those two things really can destroy an organization quicker than you can think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I am grateful for our staff who have um, really been harmed by our inaction and still are here to tell us what we did so that we can repair. Yeah. But again, that is from having a foundation that was already established and that we're building on and giving people more and more space to be able to, to, to be heard and be willing to speak. And a commitment to being in this learning zone together. And we talked in our last episode about that, that we have to be on this learning journey together, each of us, you know, learning and growing. It's never a, an end product. It's, you're never gonna achieve perfectionism with this as much as we'd like to, we have to acknowledge that there's more to grow. There's more, more, more growth and learning to do at an individual level and an organization level. And we have to have the expectation that we're all willing to do that ongoing growth and development to advance the work. Charlie, you said something a, few minute, a little bit ago about uh, creating more spaces. And I, want, I wanted to get back to that. That's one of the things we've been really intentional about because white supremacy culture values quantity over quality. It's like, get as much done as you can, like plow through the agenda, check things off your list. It's something that is very normalized in meetings and how we show up. And we've had to be really intentional in our agendas to have less is more be the model so that we actually have the space and time needed for folks to truly genuine, truly and authentically make their contributions and then to engage in some discourse and dialogue around it. You can get a lot checked off your list if everybody's like, yep, yep, I agree, I agree, let's do it. 
And are you getting the best quality decisions and actions? No. So we've had to really look at our agendas and say, that's too many items on the list. We need to pull some off, whether that's an ad hoc group. The work still has to get done. It's not like the, but you find another place to do that work so that you can really focus on the two or three key things at hand so that you can engage in the in-depth discussion because truly you want the quality to prevail over the quantity of things you get through. And so so many meetings at the academy I've really seen, I think leadership began modeling this in our agendas and I've seen teams and others making sure to, to create time and space, even starting with an embodiment practice or, or an emotional bandwidth to just, or a connection activity, because those are important. The process and relationship building work is so important. And if you just come in, you know, so many of us are predisposed. My top strength is achiever. I mean, that's great in some days, but it's really difficult on other days. And so how do you come in and say, I'm gonna be present. I'm gonna be focused on connection and relationship or whatever I need to do to get grounded for this conversation. I'm gonna listen and I'm gonna engage and I'm gonna hear and we might get less done, but we're gonna get better done. Very well said. Um, and, and I think part of that is, is sort of, in a way, sort of tying into our, our last point that we're going to cover is how do we face some of those obstacles, challenges, missteps of, you know, we tried this and it didn't turn out so well, or it, it was met with, oh, no, this, we really did not like this at all. So what did you find to be, you know, additionally important in, in, in add on to everything you've mentioned so far? you know, when you do reach some of those obstacles or challenges, like what, what are some of those key areas that you lean into that, that really helps you to kind of work through some of those challenges and obstacles? Go you ahead. ready? <laughs> I, I, I am, but go ahead. Okay. I, I had one that kind of ties into what I just said. So for yes, instance, the meeting agenda, like we created space and time for folks to do an emotional bandwidth or embodiment practice. And then we started hearing from some members of our team, when I engage in embodiment practice, it, it can activate my emotions in a way that, that makes it difficult for me to engage in the meeting. And, you know, can I turn my camera off? Can I, you know, step out? Is that a voluntary piece? And so we had to hear, this was something we intended to really be helpful and it wasn't helpful for everybody. So how do we then hear that and say, okay, how do we modify this so it's optional or so folks know how and when they can engage or disengage because we want the things we're doing to be helpful, not harmful. And so when we just ongoing listening and having staff graciously share those experiences so we can learn from them and, and continue to advance from there. I think what, um, what I was going to say is about um, uh, what I started to, to talk about earlier about peers. It really is about sharing your obstacles, challenges, and successes. And sharing them for, for a couple of reasons. One, so you can hear them outside of your head and outside of your experience so people can make comment on them. And since then some things can be seen that you wouldn't have seen just rattling it through your head. Um, your, your peers have options that you wouldn't have thought about because they're different people than you. Um, and um, one of the things <clears throat> that we're often taught as leaders is that you're the leader as opposed to this being a collective of any sort. And when you work in a, let me say it differently, when I work in a collective, um, I, I get to understand things more fully and I end up making much better decisions than if I did it by myself or with one, even with another person. And if you do things as a collective, then it spreads more quickly. If I do it as an individual, then I know it and I know how I did it and I'm great. But the organization hasn't progressed further from the experience of talking about my challenge or my success. I feel like, oh, sorry. I, I, it, it's just about being competitive. One of the one of the rules that we're taught is we need to have a competitive leadership process, and and it, I just think a, a 
a collective leadership process works so much better and it works better for us at the academy it's freaky because it feels like you're in my head because the last piece i was going to raise around strategies for doing this work was around power hoarding another characteristic of white supremacy culture and we're we have this ingrained belief that leadership team needs to be a small distinct group that makes decisions on behalf of the entire organization and that they know all and can do everything without a lot of, you know, sharing of that power. So about two years ago, we expanded our five person leadership team to a broader team. We, it's now called our shared leadership team that includes managers, directors, and executives. It's about 23 folks. And we have been very intentional in bringing that team together to, to come in and weigh in and discuss organizational strategy and organizational culture, because it's not realistic to think that as an organization, an organization grows and wants to have impact, that five individuals can adequately represent the needs and the perspectives of 125 staff. So we've really needed to expand that out and be intentional in our efforts to actually share the space and the floor with other members of our broader leadership team so we can hear and make decisions based on that broader sharing. And I would say, it, you know, it takes more time. Things take more time. But again, the quality of the outcome is increasing because we're taking the time to engage a broader portion of our, our population, many of whom who have much more direct exposure to the staff that are going to be impacted by the decision. I think it's important to, to, to give those numbers again, Jen, because um, in larger organizations, I'm sure some people are thinking, well, yeah, that's easy with a small organization, but I've seen it happen in larger organizations and those numbers are important. You want me to share the numbers again? Yeah, about, yes. What? So we went from a five person leadership team that was just our director level and CEO CFO to a currently 22 person leadership team that includes managers, directors, and CEO, CFO. And that's to manage an organization of about 125 individuals. While the, the numbers inherently may feel small, I, I think it, it's still being able to, to a certain extent, like scale of how do we incorporate more folks who are not only in tuned from on sort of the higher level of leadership, but also in tune on the other side of leadership where they are very connected to staff on a day-to-day -day basis, because mm -hmm. in a sense, that's very informative mm -hmm. to be able to have that information that will sort of trickle up, we'll then start to see like, okay, now this is what I'm hearing on, on that level. Mm -hmm. That's then going to impact larger decisions. It's going to, then going to influence everybody else. Exactly. And once you expand that team, you have to recognize it's going to take time for those broader members to show up in, a, in the way you want them to, because they're like, really? No, wait, wait, you just want, what, what do you want? Are you, am I just sitting here? Am I contributing? And there's a lot of second guessing, like, is this genuinely where you want me to actually input into a decision? Or is this lip service? And there's a lot of reasons, valid reasons why folks have those thoughts. And so we've really had to work through a lot of group process, group agreements, really clear expectations about what are we making a decision on versus another team? And how does the agenda even get created in a way that makes sure that we're all actively contributing to certain types of decisions and who's facilitating the meetings and all of those things, having a check-in at the end to see if we honored our group agreements. It's a team development process that is required to put in place before the group can actually really get in a, a zone of being able to operate in that way that the new expectations are being set. And we're still, we're still in the midst of that. We're not through it. And I think it's reflective of any other group that you're trying to incorporate into, into your organization effectively. So um, if you talk about um, um, people of color, if you talk about women, if you talk about um, any other um, group that is marginalized in your organization, shifting that is going to come with all those questions that Jen just mentioned. Um, and 
and you will you will need to have answers and consistent um, responses and processes to include them. And since we're talking about that and a difficult part of this process, I think it's important to remember that when we get to obstacles, when we get to difficulties, our first response is to regress back to what we know, back to that we're comfortable with, back to, um, I just think about a well-worn pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. You know, that one that that's all comfortable and it may have holes in it. It may not be appropriate to wear, but you want to put them on anyway. Um, and you really just need to put on the new pants. Which speaks to the importance of that ongoing awareness of that tendency and the commitment to overcome that tendency on a daily basis, if not hourly, if not minute by minute. I'm loving all the analogies to clothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want I think, those jeans. I'm like, right, where is right? that pair? I don't have any pairs that fit anymore. <laughs> You got to add more, you know, you got to add like, you know, like I think what you're talking earlier about adding buttons to, to sort of the final mm -hmm. product. And it, it, I think it, it is part of the, the, the beauty of, of something like this, where it's, it's ever evolving. It's, it's ever growing. It's, it's going to be something that, you know, it's going to be influenced by different changes naturally from the people that you bring in, from the culture, from even influences that's happening in the world and, and just how does that influence the the ever-evolving part of this and, and I think that's what's beautiful is that it's it doesn't stay stagnant it shouldn't stay stagnant in fact and it, it's something that it, it it really energizes people to to continue in their work because it's it's not meant to be stagnant um and and one I you know before we kind of start to bring this all together and it's sort of like you know share our takeaways I want to just say like I'm, I'm very honored and blessed to be in community with you both um you know strong female leaders within our organization I think that's it, it shows that we're we're really being able to find different ways to sort of get different perspectives and, and get different approaches and, and different ideas and, and just how diverse even our leadership here at the organization like it I, I think to be able to find ways to really show that we're ever evolving and show that we're intentional about how we want to move forward so I definitely want to say thank you to you both you know in in this episode previous episode just in being community with you both Thank you for saying that. I have also really been honored to be in this community with you. And funny that you mentioned that one of the things we're actively working on, Manola and I are on a, a curriculum advisory group as we speak to develop a, a training series on cultural responsive leadership. So we're looking at what are the foundational knowledge, skills, and practices that any leader in health and human services or beyond needs to be able to engage in to bring about changes in the organization that it can occur if you engage and lead in a culturally responsive manner. So we're piloting the series this fall with some of our staff and some folks that have worked closely with us in the past. And then our goal is next spring that we would have information about this to share with our current partners or new partners for folks that really want to continue this journey and take it to a different level of depth around culturally responsive leadership practice. So more to come on that. So thank you very much, both of you, for sharing this space. I think that by being in conversation and in community, I grow. And I actually only grow when I'm in community. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to grow. In a sense, we're all in community, including our listeners. <laughs> so before I start to wrap up today's um, episode, you know, was there any other takeaways that we would like to kind of share around our topic today or just for our listeners? Stick with it. Keep focused. Um, yeah, don't let up because we can't bring about changes if we're not continuing to be committed to this work. So push through and keep 
keep doing the important work. Yeah, you owe it to your organization and to your staff to take these hard steps. And ultimately to the broader community, because my philosophy is if you have an organization that cultivates a healthy organization, you have staff who are engaged and satisfied and energized by your work, they're going home to their communities and they are showing up differently and they are more positive. They're bringing positive energy to the world and they're cultivating healthy con community wherever they go. And so it doesn't stop with our staff. It really extends beyond when you can really have them be engaged and feel valued, cared for, supported, and heard. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Well, listeners, um, as, as they both mentioned, create that ripple, really create that ripple that'll, you know, transcend to your organization, to your staff, and ultimately to the community. So definitely want to thank our listeners uh, very much for listening to this episode. And we'll be back with you soon with another Academy i3 podcast episode. Take care, everyone.